Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. U.S. crime rates are down overall. So why are prisons and jails bursting at the seams? More than one in every hundred American adults is incarcerated. That's 2.3 million people making the U.S. the world's number one jailer. 700,000 Americans are released from prison every year, as are 13 million from U.S. jails. What's their future? Where do they go? What is their impact on their communities? To discuss the facts, the fictions, the faults, and the fixes of America's incarcerated is Jeremy Travis, the president of CUNY's John Jay College of Criminal Justice. Prior to coming to CUNY, he was a senior fellow at the Justice Policy Center at the Urban Institute, and before that, he directed the National Institute of Justice. He had other priors, including deputy commissioner in the NYPD. Most recently, he chaired the Committee on the Causes and Consequences of High Rates of Incarceration, a product of the National Research Council, an arm of the National Academy of Sciences. The committee just released a major study, The Growth of Incarceration in the United States, Exploring Causes and Consequences. Welcome back. Good to be back. Great. Really important study. I mean, this is a classic work of rigorous policy analysis. Congratulations. Thank you. How long did this take? How did this start, and how long did it take? This is a massive work, and you had 20 contributors. The project itself uh, was over a two-year period. We had five meetings, uh, 20 scholars uh, convened by the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, if you go back, uh, there's longer history, of course, of trying to get this project off the ground and raise f uh, money for it. Um, and uh, it's, it's really, for all of us who were on this committee, this was a, um, just a moment where we wanted to make this contribution. So uh, people did this work and uh, did it willingly uh, because of the importance of the topic. But you've been thinking about this for, for years, years and years. What was it like just editing? 20 separate pieces of analysis into a coherent whole. Well, we, we wanted to um, tell a story. We wanted to tell a story about how the nation got to this point where we've uh, increased the use of prison as a response to crime uh, by f a fourfold increase in the incarceration rates. Uh, and we knew, because we were convened by the National Academy of Sciences, that what we were working with was, uh, was the evidence. So it was, right. it was a review of the research. Uh, but we didn't want this to be a dry, um, boring uh, academic. And it's certain, and you succeeded uh, in not making it you. so. Uh, we wanted this to be something that uh, people could access for for policy discussions, and uh, that it would stand the test of time. So uh, it was it was a uh, labor of love for all of us. My vice chair, Bruce Weston at Harvard, and I uh, we put a lot of time into this because uh, we think it's an important topic. Central question is, how did we get here with, a, with this fourfold increase in incarceration rates? Talk about the causes, both, you know, immediate and more contextual, more societal. Well, this was, we, we were convened to answer two questions. Go ahead. Causes and consequences. So the first one is, how did we get here? Right. And the National Academy of Sciences asked us to take a look at a, uh, a phenomenon uh, in our country uh, and try to unpack it, to explain it. And the phenomenon put on the table for inquiry uh, was this fourfold increase in incarceration rates. What the nation needs to remember is we haven't always been here. For 50 years, from 1920 to the early 1970s, we had a stable incarceration rate of about 100 uh, per 100,000. And then in 1972, it started to go up. The, the, the visual, the graphics are just mind-blowing in terms of the extent of the slope. So this is uh, unprecedented in our uh, national history. We've not always been here. Uh, and it's um, unique internationally. Um, so our first question was to try to explain this phenomenon uh, that has no precedent in our history. And we looked at the, what we call the proximate drivers, what types of crimes are being incarcerated at what level. 
We looked at the uh, political context uh, within which those uh, sentencing reforms were enacted, and mm -hmm. then we took a big step back and asked what I think are the, the most fundamental questions, which is what was going on in the country yep. that allowed all this to happen? And there, the, uh, the answer is, uh, I think, important for us as we think about where do we go from right. here, important is to re for us really to come to grips with our own history. So we tell the story of the 1960s, the 1970s, and the, the urban riots, and the social unrest, and uh, the increased uh, segregation in urban America, the, the spike in crime that occurred in the 60s and 70s when homicide rates doubled. It was a very scary time. Mm -hmm. uh, and that environment allowed politicians to develop what became a very winning political formula, which is, I'm going to be tough on crime and I'm going to enact legislation uh, that will be uh, tougher on cr criminals, those who commit crime, than anybody else. And that became a winning political strategy. So that set us off in a direction uh, that has allowed our political um, entities, mostly legislatures, but also our uh, executive At all branch levels. agencies, both state and federal, mm -hmm. uh, to enact policies that have resulted in this fourfold increase in incarceration. So the, the first and I think very important finding is that the increase, the fourfold increase starting in 1972 is not because of crime rates, because crime went up and went down over that period of time. It's because of policy choices that we made through our elected representatives. And those elected representatives were chosen on a different um, sort of crime platform, which is tough on crime. And that crime platform was made possible by the turbulence of the 60s and 70s, part of which was an increase in crime. So we tell a story that traces this back to crime, not as a proximate cause, but as a, as a contributor to this different political environment. Yeah, and it was mediated through the political calculations of actors and their response to electorates. Right. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Now, the number one question after you read all of this, and you've got extensive data, is, did it work in its stated function? I mean, let's, let's social policy has stated functions. Right. Did it meet its state, stated function of reducing crime? Right. So there were at least a couple stated functions. One was to reduce crime. Was to, one was to respond to crime. Okay. And clearly, we responded to crime. So to the extent that the political uh, imperative was to be tougher because people didn't like crime, we accomplished that. The question now is at what cost? and with what benefit. So looking at it through a cost-benefit uh, lens, uh, we took a hard look at the question of the impact of this ramp up of incarceration on crime in America. And we looked first at the aggregate levels. And uh, as I said, crime went up and crime went down during this period of time. So it's hard to find a direct correlation. A number of scholars have tried to disentangle this complicated social phenomenon, sure. of lots more people in prison from a complicated social phenomenon called crime. And uh, so our first conclusion as a matter of science was that there's no clear answer. So that may be disappointing to some, uh, but that's where we ended up. It's but that's your charge for the National Academy of Sciences because yeah. this is real science. This is rigor. Right, right. This is not what we want to think. Right. This is not what the politicians and it's are evidence. saying. You've got to have evidence for and it. And so the first conclusion is there's an uncertainty about trying to even answer the question. However, we say two other things. One is that the studies that have tried to answer the question have all found, with a couple exceptions, that the impact of high incarceration rates on crime has been modest. So it raises this question whether the, the buildup, which is very expensive, mm -hmm. $80 billion a year now we're spending on, uh, on prisons and jails, uh, has produced commensurate benefits. So when we say it's modest, we ask the question later in the book whether uh, that's a, a good uh, calculation. But we also are clearer in assessing the evidence regarding two, the two phenomena that really drove the incarceration uh, increase. And the first is long sentences being made longer. Three strikes, you're out. Truth in sentencing. Um, life without parole. A lot of what we did over this four-decade period was to make long sentences longer. There the evidence is that those longer sense, that increment, has very little effect on crime rates. And that sort of stands to reason because we're putting old people in prison to be slightly older. Right. Right? Uh, and the other driver of the incarceration rate in terms of statutory changes uh, was 
decisions by our legislatures to require sentences of incarceration for people who otherwise would have been sentenced to a community sanction, mandatory minimums. Yep. And there, the evidence is also very clear that those don't bring crime rates down much. So the two drivers, we're, we have strong evidence to say that uh, long sentences longer and mandatory minimums uh, have very little effect on crime rates. So when you look at that, it's less surprising to find our overall conclusion that even though the evidence is uncertain, they all tend towards the low end of the spectrum, low impact on crime. And As you disaggregate the various policies. Right. Okay, go ahead. So that sets up the question, so how do we uh, reverse course knowing what we now know based on this review of the evidence? Right. Okay. So we've got an idea of the causes, both proximate, mm -hmm. but certainly proximate. Go to the more systemic causes that, that is often overlooked, not only in, in, in studies of incarceration, but in, in terms of education, these larger contextual variables, right. if you will. So we, we spend a, a chapter looking at uh, changes in American cities, changes in crime policy, uh, changes in race relations, uh, and we note uh, with you know, very deep concern that a lot of the political discussion has a, a racialized dimension to it. We need only remember Willie Horton, remember how that reverberated in a presidential election. Um, so the, the, the idea that, that crime policy is a matter of presidential elections and the matter of, of state-level elections, as opposed to being a local community concern, mm -hmm. is a change in American uh, society. So the, the context within which we're deciding how to punish, how to respond to crime, now has all these different uh, layers of dimension as opposed to working with the young people yep. who are involved in crime yep. at the local level. So uh, we, we comment on uh, the, the, the deep uh, impact of this incarceration boom on those communities, and particularly on poor communities of color. So the increase in incarceration is not evenly spread across the country. It, and it's dramatically not it's, even. It is, the, the statistics are, I would say, staggering. So I'll just give you Go a, couple, a Go. couple that I think really uh, should be a, a wake-up call for the country. So we look at two cohorts of, uh, birth cohorts of young African-American men, those born in the late 40s and those born in the late 70s, mm. so a generation apart. Sure. Those born in the late 40s, if a high school dropout within that um, uh, segment of our population, young African-American men, if you were born in the 40s, you had a, about a 15% chance of spending at least a year in prison. That's high by any measure. But with the incarceration buildup and the concentration of prison in small segments of our society, mm -hmm. communities of color, and drawing more and more uh, young men into longer prison sentences right. and mandatory minimums for prison and the war on drugs, which has brought many more of them into, into We've got to talk about that. Go ahead. Now, the lifetime probability that a high school dropout who's African-American and is male will serve at least a year in prison is 68%. Two-thirds. It's gone from 58% to 68%. So we have to ask ourselves whether this is sustainable as a democracy when uh, this is becoming a uh, sort of a normative experience. This is a, a way of thinking about your growing up chances if you drop out of high school. Sure. That you're likely, highly likely to go to prison. Uh, another statistic makes the same point is that today as we sit here, uh, an African-American uh, male uh, dropout from high school is more likely to be in prison than working. Wow. So this, th these policy choices that we've made, so the, the, the bottom line of this report is that we have chosen to be here. Right. And that may be a hard uh, realization to face, but we have chosen through our elected officials to be here. Now we have to look at the consequences of having quadrupled the rate of incarceration and putting America outside of the context of any other Western democracy, where we are using prison heavily as, a, as, a, as our premier preferred response to crime. Okay. Then you, you, now that we've looked at sort of the, the, the causes of it and some of the conditions, what are the consequences both for the individual and the communities? Certainly the individual, you can, you can almost assume, but the, the community impacts that you talk about here are really deeply pernicious and basically hidden. 
Well, I think one of the contributions that uh, our report uh, has made to this national conversation has been to draw on the literature uh, that exists in the psychological uh, literature uh, and in the health literature about the, the impact of being incarcerated. What is it like to live in a prison for years and years on end? Uh, and what is uh, the quality of life in those prisons? So the first consequence that we look at after we treat public safety is the consequence upon the individual. Okay. And uh, what we find are that the prisons have become much more overcrowded. Um, cells that were built for one person now house two, sometimes three people. Uh, the uh, availability of uh, programming, which we used to think was very, very important uh, sort of sure. role of prisons is to help people work on uh, their job training skills, their uh, anger management, uh, drug addiction, whatever, while they're in prison, the programming has gone down. Uh, we note, uh, I think it's an important thing to, to note, is that the uh, level of violence in prisons has gone down. Sur surprisingly, given the, well, the, the, the overcrowding, you would think that that would just enhance uh, tension. I, I, here I give a lot of credit to, uh, to our colleagues who run prisons. I okay. think they've become more professional. Okay. I think they're better trained. Um, but that doesn't mean that the quality of life for those incarcerated generally has, has gotten sure. better. And, and we have crowded many more people uh, into our prisons. But then we look at the health issues and the psychological impact and the, uh, the increased use of administrative segregation, or solitary confinement, right. uh, and the longer sentences, uh, the fact that we now have geriatric prisons, that we have people on dialysis machines. I mean, the, the idea that prisons have, have become sort of this other parallel universe uh, and that we don't pay as much attention to them as we should. So one of our recommendations is to open up the prisons for public scrutiny, for levels of accountability, for the courts and journalists and uh, researchers to be given access mm -hmm. to prisons. Um, this is a very important institution of our justice system, of our society. Uh, and during this period of the ramp up, our conclusion is that the amount of public attention given to prisons and the people who run prisons and the people who live in prisons uh, has gone down. Uh, but then we look at the consequences beyond the individual. And we look at uh, family members, we look at life after prison, we look at children, we look at consequences for communities of concentrated incarceration and for our democracy. Mm -hmm. And there, again, reviewing the evidence, uh, as the National Academy of Sciences uh, would require us to do, um, the, the evidence is mixed in the sense, not in the sense of the strength of it, but in the sense of that it's all over the place. So we, we end up putting together a composite picture that when you look at it that way, is very troubling. So uh, we have uh, two million uh, children now with a parent in prison. What we know from the evidence is that, uh, particularly if it's the father who's in prison, which is the more likely case, uh, f and particularly for the sons of those uh, incarcerated parents, uh, there's, there's uh, increased uh, uh, emotional difficulty, uh, that there's increased residential instability for the entire family, uh, problems of attachment, so long term, if this is our new normal, mm -hmm. uh, with many people in prison and many, and all of them have, uh, not all of them, but most of them have children, uh, we have to think about the impact of that on the next generation, the intergenerational consequences. Sure. Uh, we know also, and here the evidence is quite strong, that people who have been in prison have uh, a 10 to 30 percent lower uh, lifetime earnings, merely for the fact of having been in prison. They've been taken out of the out of the workplace uh, for that period of time. We haven't been giving them skills. They come back, it's hard to get jobs. Whole sectors of our economy are closed off to them. So they earn less. What does that mean for the families of those individuals and the, uh, their ability to, um, to accumulate wealth and pass it along is what we hope for uh, middle-class Americans. Uh, and then we look at the communities of uh, high concentration of incarceration with the, where there's, there's this churning phenomenon of of people being arrested, sent yep. away, released, arrested, sent away, and released, and supervised. Um, and those communities, again, are already suffering from lots of other uh, social disadvantage with you know, poor schools and poor health care. And now we've asked them to bear the burden of our choice yeah. to increase fourfold the rate of incarceration and to take lots of men out of those communities and to take them out for a long period of time and then send them, send them back. So, again, the evidence it will be stronger over time, but right now the, the composite picture is enough uh, for us to uh, say that, that the, 
these policies are not serving the country well. <laughs> and particularly those communities where we should be concerned about their well-being as we're concerned about income inequality, we're concerned about racial justice, we're concerned about, about uh, the plight of, uh, you know, here the president's announced an initiative on uh, My Brother's Keeper for yep. uh, young boys and men in communities of color. So all of this is a very disturbing uh, uh, composite picture. Okay, correctives. You, uh, the report suggests three major areas. Sentencing policy, and you've talked about the, the problems with the sentencing, prison policy and social policy. Briefly, what are these before we get into what I found really interesting were your guiding principles. So uh, talk about the correctives, and let's move into those four guiding principles. So the bottom line recommendation is from our committee, from the National Academy of Sciences report, is that the, uh, the nation should uh, significantly reduce the, the level of incarceration. We don't give that a, a, uh, a percentage uh, uh, context, uh, but we do mean significantly. Uh, so this fourfold increase of incarceration is not serving the country well. Below that re overarching recommendation, we have uh, some policy recommendations in the sentencing area that flow from the evidence. Uh, and there are three. One is to uh, review sentencing reforms where we decided as a democracy to make long sentences longer. Three strikes, uh, truth in sentencing, life without parole, all of these are amenable to legislative reconsideration. We also recommend a reconsideration of mandatory minimums, that we needn't put people in prison automatically yep. for minimum sentences of a year or five years or ten years, uh, we've taken discretion away from judges. We need to think about community sanctions uh, more creatively. Uh, and many people would do better uh, being sanctioned in the community. And then we recommend that there be a reexamination of what we call the war on drugs. So the increase in drug cases has been tenfold. Well, it's driving much of this. While the increase in everything else has been fourfold. Uh, and when, when we review the evidence on the effectiveness of that approach to drug use and drug sale, what we find is that uh, prices have gone down, not up, as you might have expected with this ramped up enforcement. It would drive the price up, an economist would expect. Too much demand sucking in supply. And we would expect that, uh, that uh, use would go, uh, would go down. In fact, use has been, remained constant. So there's an example of a policy that, that, uh, where incarceration has been a uh, very blunt instrument. Uh, and we're, we're just stuck in that one, uh, one gear. So those are the three uh, policy changes in the sentencing domain. We also recommend that the uh, nation take a new look at, uh, at prisons. Uh, I just alluded to this, that we need to open up prisons for review and ask, what is the purpose of this institution? Uh, how do we subject it to legislative oversight so that there's a set of expectations for what we want prisons to do? We, we you know, provide appropriate funding for programming. Uh, and obviously, we, we are recommending that there be fewer people in those sure, prisons. Sure, sure. Uh, and then the third policy domain is to look at the communities that are, have been suffering uh, from high rates of incarceration uh, and that are already struggling with uh, other uh, indicia of, uh, of social disadvantage. Uh, and if prisons come down, we'll now have those individuals who would have sure, been in prison sure. with the same health problems and workforce problems. Sure. Uh, so that's a long view, uh, but a very important third domain. Okay, before we get to guiding principles, well, do it. Do it, do it relatively quickly because I want to get yeah. to, I, I sense optimism here. I sense optimism in your statements, and I sense optimism in the emails that you've been sending me. Right. So talk quickly, uh, you know, briefly well, about the so, guiding principles. So the guiding principles, we, we, we reviewed the evidence, the, the empirical evidence about the ramp up and the consequences. But at the end of the day, we recognized that uh, the decision to, to enact these policies and certainly the decision to reverse course uh, should be uh, guided by normative values. More than just empirical More data. Just, and this can't be answered by a cost-benefit equation. Right. So we review the scholarship uh, of four guiding principles which we recommend uh, that the nation should uh, pay attention to going forward and, we say, didn't get enough attention over the four decades. One is proportionality. We shouldn't punish people beyond the severity of the crime. The second is parsimony, that the state, in essence, has no right to in inflict pain on somebody beyond that required to achieve a legitimate social purpose. Okay. 
these are limits on the power of the state, well known to anybody uh, who's uh, gone to law school, but we lost sight of these. Uh, the third is the uh, notion of citizenship. We need to remember that the people we put in prison uh, are entitled to human dignity, that to be treated decently, uh, consistent with safety requirements while they're in prison, and that the prison experience shouldn't diminish their status as citizens when they come back home, as they all do, unless, right. unless they right. die there. Uh, and the fourth uh, guiding principle is this notion of social justice, that the prison has to be reconceptualized as a pillar of justice. It's not a place we send people and we, we forget them. It's a way of thinking about, thinking about an important social purpose. Uh, and we go back to the Quakers, this is how we've thought about prisons. Uh, and we need to, to reestablish that notion that the uh, prisons serve an important social purpose. Okay. A little bit of optimism. I, I, I sense that. You, you, we have a long way to go, but encouraging signs? It, it's so interesting that this report is coming out at a time when, and I wouldn't have been optimistic five years ago. There's just a lot going on. We have a number of states, and we cite them in the report with respect, that have done the hard work yep. of starting to reverse course, yep. 20 plus. The federal government, uh, starting with the president, starting with the attorney general, uh, bipartisan uh, coalitions uh, of unlikely, unlikely partners in the Senate and the House, uh, looking to uh, take a critical examination of the federal uh, criminal law uh, and sentencing policy. We have uh, left-right coalitions uh, that I didn't think would have been uh, possible uh, looking, uh, coming together uh, on these issues. We have something called the Right on Crime Group, signatories from uh, the uh, right side of the political spectrum uh, that we need to reverse course. So it is a time for optimism. Our committee, noting that and being optimistic, would however remind people that we have a long ways to go. Okay. So we, we can't take uh, solace from the fact that now two or three years running, we've seen a, a slight uh, downward trend in incarceration rates against, when you look at the long 40-year history of the ramp up, uh, when we say that our committee recommends a significant reduction, uh, significant is a lot more than what we've done so far, but the politics are changing. We have, you have to come back and talk about this, and I know we have to break because we're over time already. I want to talk to you in the fall about your latest project on misdemeanor reform, which I'm really interested in. But congratulations. This is a solid piece of policy analysis, and I hope it has legs. Thank you. Thanks to John J. President Jeremy Travis for being on the show, for sharing his knowledge, his insights, and his advocacy. Join me next week when my guest will be Terry Galway to talk about the good old days of Tammany Hall here on CUNY TV. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email, whatever it is. Thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it, send it.